You see, there has been an idea gestating in my brown noggin for quite a while now, an idea for a randomly occurring segment uh, here on the show that I haven't had time for until now. Plus, it makes a strange perverse, perverse sort of sense to have our discussion of Kentucky Fried Movie be a random hodgepodge of various subjects, just like the film. Yeah. So this new randomly occurring segment came to me uh, from all of the fun that I have doing story times here on the podcast, where I take the history of an uh, actor or director and the making of the film, and I get all of this information and sort of approximate it into a fun story in my own unique voice. So occasionally here on the podcast, I will be doing that sort of story time, but with history. With history. Yes, so I will be getting uh, moments in history and uh, uh, reworking them into my own voice with this first episode of what I am calling Steve's Historical Approximations. Okay. And this week, we are talking... What? You got a fruit snack without acting? Without acting? You you know you need to act like a pirate every time you have fruit snacks. So act like a pirate. Act like a pirate, I said. Or you don't get the fruit snacks. No, act act adult. Okay, well, ask me if you can have fruit snacks. Yes, but first you need to act like a pirate. Our that was a really good pirate. Uh, yes, you can eat that, but give one to Eleanor. It's called Eleanor Tex. Give one of them to Eleanor, and then you can have the rest. Steve's historical approximations. This week, we are talking about the Osagi Indian murders. Okay. You don't know about the Osagi Indian murders? Kentucky Fried Movie was so funny. Go ahead. Indian Murders. Kentucky Fried Movie was really funny, but we are going to be talking about the Osagi Indian Murders. There's a new book about the subject that just recently came out called um, Blood of the Flower Moon or Flower of the Blood Moon. Something about murdering flowers. So... (laughs) So um, let's talk about the Osagi murders. I am surprised. I am surprised that this happened and not surprised that America doesn't talk about it. Because surprise, surprise, America has a longstanding history of fucking Native Americans over. Yes. Surprise, surprise. America has a history of screwing Native Americans in the ass. You it's, see this, it's Larry? A, it's a hobby. You, you see know. this, Larry? Unless you're watching this on TV. This is what you get, Larry. This is what you get when you find a stranger in the Alps. <laughs> so, um, so the government is like, hey, Native Americans, uh, you can't be in this uh, land anymore because we want it. So we're going to move you to this state. And, uh, yeah, you're going to have to walk there. I, we should have told you that, too. We're not giving you a ride. Just walk to this totally different state. Okay, now this is your state. Now you stay here. You know what? No, no, we like this state now. <laughs> We're going to move you to this different piece of land. This is some really shitty land, and we don't want it. So, uh, yeah, pick up your shit and walk to this other state. This is going to be your land now because uh, we want that state that we gave you originally because yeah. it looks pretty. And uh, it goes with our eyes. So walk, <laughs> to the, walk, to this, walk to this other piece of land. It's really crappy. And uh, there you go. Now this is your land. Now, ooh, wait, we like this land. Like, we hated the land until we gave it to you, and now that it's yours, we totally want this land back. So here, here's this other bit of land. You're going to have to walk there, too. So uh, the government was doing this to the Osagi Indians until eventually they found, uh, they gave the Osagi Indians this crappy, dead, barren, lifeless land in Oklahoma. Right? Okay. But here's the shittiest land in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma. Have fun with it. We definitely will not want the land back because it's Oklahoma and Oklahoma fucking sucks. So you know what? Here, we'll even put it in writing. Here you go. Uh, 1907. 
putting this in writing, the government will not take this land from the Osagis. Ha ha, burn on them. We gave them shitty land. Good luck with that, you SOBs. Signed, government. So, um, also in 1907, in, the, in that bit of dialogue, um, they, a really long bit of uh, paperwork, a lot of information on it. And in there, the government gave every member of the Osagi tribe uh, 657 acres. And also, uh, each and every Osagi, or it's important here, the Osagi's legal heirs were given a percentage of any possible oil or natural whatever that they find on the land. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah like that's going to happen. Yeah. So the government signed that contract, and of course, like, seconds later, they find oil. Yeah. They don't just find oil. The Osagi Indians find a shit ton of oil. <laughs> like, the most oil. They found all of the oil. Out of nowhere, a small Indian tribe in Oklahoma becomes like the Middle East, as far as oil is concerned. It's just everywhere. And just imagine, it's crazy because, like, here's these Indians. They keep getting screwed and screwed and screwed and screwed and screwed. And then they blink. And suddenly, they're in a Snoop Dogg video. <laughs> Just imagine these poor-ass Indians, and they keep getting screwed and keep getting screwed, and they blink their eyes, and suddenly, they're just rich as shit. Like, literally, overnight, they all have mansions and limos, and a bunch of the uh, Osagi families, you know, they're like poor, uh, downtrodden, Native Americans, and suddenly they're like, maybe we should send Junior to school in Europe. <laughs> like, literally, they blink, and suddenly they're all rich, and it's a rap video. It's, it's 1920 now, and literally, this is fucking amazing to me, it's 1920, and literally, the Osagi tribe suddenly becomes the richest people per capita in the entire world. Nice. Yeah, it's crazy. It's a crazy ass story. You think of the entire world, the entire world, and the Osagi Indians are the richest people. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing it right. I'm yeah. pretty sure I Osagi Indians. So, um, so, but 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 here's another way to look at it. It's racist, racist ass 1920s America. Mm -hmm. And you know who the richest people are in America in 1920? A small Native American tribe. You know who had a problem with that? White America. I, I would imagine that. I was kind of wondering where it got there. So white fucking America had a big ass problem. With the richest people in America being a, uh, a small Native American tribe in Oklahoma. So this is what happened, okay? Mm -hmm. This is so fucked up. So white America had a fucking problem with this. So in 1921, the fucking U.S. Congress, Congress! <laughs> so fucked up. Congress passes a law. And the law is basically this. Hey, you know these Osagi Indians? Yeah, they're Indians. And you know what that means? It means they're fucking stupid. Okay. So, and, and again, don't think that I'm, I, Steve, am being racist. I'm just telling the story. Here's your water bottle, Eleanor. Everything's fine. Cool, cool, cool your jets. I'm not the one being racist. I am simply trying to explain how white America is being racist. Yeah. I don't think these things. It's white America in 1921 who's saying these things, not me. So anyway, Congress passes a law. And the law is basically Indians are fucking stupid and they cannot be trusted with 
this money. So each and every Osagi Indian tribe oh, member. Kirby. Ooh, is everything okay? Oh, the dog was just ready to launch at another dog. Jesus. That's why you should never watch Charlie Brown cartoons around your dog. Okay, sorry. That's okay. So Congress passes a law, and the law basically says Native Americans are stupid. We can't trust them with large amounts of money. So each and every Osagi Indian tribe member will be assigned a guardian mm -hmm. to look over their money until each and every Osagi Indian can prove to the government that they are not uh, that they are not stupid. Oh. And that they are capable of taking care of this money on their own. Because they're because they're they're Indians. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get white people in in Oklahoma to take care of their money, look over their money for these Native Americans as a service to them, because Lord knows they can't be trusted with this massive amount of money. They're Indians. Yeah. So here comes white America to save you. And you know what? We're going to... It, it, don't worry about your money, Osagi Indians. We're going to get the nicest people in Oklahoma. We're going to get doctors and preachers and scientists, you know, learned men. Or at least people who say that they are doctors and scientists. Yes. And lawyers. People who say they are learned men, and they're going to be in charge of your well. Mind. Well, let's let's keep in mind that doctors and lawyers and scientists and all that were just as just every bit as racist as everybody else. So, so any of yeah. the any of the good ones would be like, no, I'm not working with filthy savages. Yeah. So then, like, say it, the Congress is passing this law, and they're like, "Does anyone have any questions?" Yes, you in the back. Yeah, my name is Snake. Oh, did I say Snake? I mean, Doctor James Johnson. <laughs> uh, let's say that uh, I am taking care of uh, these millions of dollars of uh, an Osagi Indian, and the Osagi Indian is murdered. Oh, I'm sorry. Accidentally passes on. <laughs> what happens to that money? And the the Congress said, "Well, that probably won't happen a lot." But if it does happen, then definitely you'll get all the money because yeah. you're a white person. And not only that, remember that law in 1907, um, you're a legal heir, so you would also get a huge percentage of the oil revenue. Oh. But it's okay. It's okay. Uh, that's not going to happen a lot. No. Not only that, but each and every miner in the Osagi Indian tribe was assigned a legal guardian regardless of whether or not they had parents. <laughs> Yay. So it's like, hey, little uh, little Johnny, your new parents are the Smiths here. But my parents are right there. Yes, well, they're Indians. We're giving white parents now. <laughs> These white parents will be taking care of you. They'll also be in charge of your money. Don't worry, though. Nothing bad's going to happen to you. You're a child. And even in 1920, bad things aren't going to happen to you. So, what happened next? The obvious happened. Yeah. From 1921 to 1925, and I want to I point out here, that's not a long period of time. No. That's small ass period in time, 1921 to 1925. But get this. Three from four years, yeah. Yeah. Get this. From 1921 to 1925, they estimate that at least, at least 60 Osagi Indians were killed. Accidentally. Via accidents or poisonings. Or here's a racist excuse that some people used. Bad whiskey. Bad whiskey. Bad. Or in some cases, just outright murder. Literally, it, it didn't matter who you were. You were an old tribal member. You were an eight-year-old boy. 
Osagi Indians were being murdered left and right by white Americans who wanted a piece of all of this shit. Yes. At least 60 Osagi Indians were killed. Probably much more. A lot of the murders went unsolved. Like a like, like these think? <laughs> Like these Osagi Indians were Spinal Tap drummers. Yes. Well, let's see here. He was smoking a cigar, and then he accidentally fell on these five bullets. You know what? Best to leave it unsolved. (laughs) Like, really fucked up. Most of the murders went unsolved, which means, and and I think this often, there's undoubtedly still some rich-ass white folks in Oklahoma. Mm Mm-hmm. That are living in a mansion somewhere in like Enid or Ponca City. And they live in this nice neighborhood and you go up to them and you're like, hey, you guys seem to be really well off. Look at that. You got like eight cars and you're a huge lawn here that's all gated and stuff. Where'd you get your money? Oh, well, you know, just good good investments and, (laughs) and and other investments that were also very good. My great grandfather certainly didn't kill a six year old Indian for it. <laughs> you know, we we've just been our money in just good investments. Yeah. In fact, sometimes like I'll see like I'll see like some commercial on TV and it's some like come on down to F- Phil Smith Ford. Phil Smith Ford, we've got the best Ford trucks and RVs. Phil Smith Ford, come on down this weekend. Big sale. Phil Smith Ford. Phil Smith Ford. Come on down to Phil Smith Ford. And I'm like, okay, you didn't get this uh, car dealership because you were the smartest cookie. You know? (laughs) You didn't get this massive, uh, expensive car dealership because you went to business school. Yeah. Something tells me past has some dead Indians in it. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. So uh, the law enforcement and, and police and shit couldn't solve this murder spree or just didn't fucking feel like it. So the Osagi Indian tribe went to the U.S. government and the U.S. government turned to a brand spanking new government agency called the FBI, the FBI. I yeah. guess is what they yeah. back then because it was brand new. We don't know what to call this, so we're gonna have to ask the Fabai for help. Yeah. Yes, Maxwell. Yeah. Yes, Maxwell. You're hungry. Okay. Do you want some slap it a face? I always have some slap it a face no, ready for you. I... Let me give you a little bit of slap it a face. Slap it a face. Sla- How come you don't want any slap it a face? I want peanut butter and jelly. You want a peanut butter and jelly slap in the face? Okay, I'll get my hand. No. Put peanut butter on one side, jelly on the other side, and then. Celebrity face, celebrity face, celebrity face. Wow. That definitely put me on a government watch list. Just yeah. FYI. I'll, I'll make you a sandwich right after I finish talking about dead Indians, okay? Okay. So they go to the Fabai, and yes. specifically, yes. they go to the very young head of the Fabai at the time, 21-year-old future cross-dresser J. Edgar Hoover. Yes. He's heading the FBI. He's only 21 freaking years old, and he's in charge of solving the Osagi Indian murders. Goddamn, when I was 21 years old, you know what I was doing? Neither do I. I was way too drunk. Yeah. <laughs> remember anything that happened at all. What are you saying, Maxwell? What, Maxwell? Oh, Native American. Native American. I will... I will... I will give. I will make you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich as soon as I'm done talking about uh, murdered Native Americans. Okay. Native Americans. Oh wait, come over here again. Come over here. Come over here and say Native Americans. Native Americans. Exactly. I said that perfectly. Thank you, Maxwell. <laughs> That's why we talked about squirrel washing yes. today on the show. So, um. 21-year-old future cross-dresser J. Edgar Hoover really wants to impress folks. So he got he he got a team together, including I, I I'm I'm happy to hear this. Um he had a Native American already in the FBI. 
Uh huh. Like the only Native American in the entire U.S. government, and 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 he's like, we need to go undercover. <laughs> So literally, uh, J. Edgar Hoover's folks went undercover in the Osagi Indian tribe for two years. This is, a, a, if it wasn't, if it wouldn't seem racist, this is definitely a uh, Leonardo DiCaprio film. Yes. I'm just closing my eyes and picturing Leonardo DiCaprio. Not as J. Edgar Hoover. He's already done that, but as the Native American who goes in, undercover. Yes, in buckskins with a lot of fringe. Yeah. 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 So they go undercover for two years, and they discover a secret crime ring led by a very popular and successful rancher in the area called William, named William Hale. They called him the King of Osagi Hills, and everybody loved him. And as it turns out, he was busy collecting dead Native Americans' oil rights like they were fucking Pokemon. <laughs> and he had an army of unsavory types that he would send out and kill all these Native Americans and then bring him the oil rights. And he was just like uh, growing his fortune. Yeah. So he was taken down. And there was a trial. They, there's a really sad, messed up part where uh, the, the, the media is like, yes, the, these men who uh, killed the Osagi Indians uh, are going on trial. Good luck, though. Good luck finding a jury of 12 white people who will actually say, you did a bad thing by killing Indians. <laughs> like, oh, that's, that's fucked up. But they were taken down and people went to jail and then that's when america was like you know what i'm so happy that they caught the uh, osagi uh, indian murders they solved they solved one big part of it they didn't solve all of them and there are still people to this day and the book deals with some of that there are people who are like i'm a 55 year old journalist and i've worked really hard and you know what i'm gonna look back into my past holy shit my father killed someone <laughs> Oh my God! My father killed someone. That's how he got all that money. But I'm also thinking. So they're, they're... I'm also thinking that you know, you you kill a couple of Indians to get their oil wells. You know, when is it that when is it become that your your decision to kill somebody becomes based on your OCD? Like if you got oil wells in one area and then you got oil wells in the other area. You know, you got to kill the guy with the oil wells in the middle so that all your oil wells are together. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So so you wind up killing a specific Osagi Indian to, to get a sense of symmetry. Yeah. So that you can start putting up hotels. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So... So this was the part where America was like, yeah, um, you know what? Um, I would say that I'm happy that they caught the Osagi Indian murderer, but I don't want to say that because they're still Indians. Let me look for someone who we can really make the hero of this, a white person. I'm done talking about Native Americans. You know what? I like this J. Edgar Hoover guy. <laughs> you know what? Maybe this is a name. That we, as an American society, should remember. Yeah, good job, J. Edgar Hoover. I'm sure that you have big things in your future. At the end of uh, episode one, The Phantom Menace. It's like, well, Anakin Skywalker, we'll look forward to your future. So well, that in that, 19- this, this reminds me of an awful documentary that I watched one night all about Monopoly. Because, you know, if you're doing a documentary on Monopoly, oh, oh, yeah. you can only keep it interesting that long. But That's interesting because uh, maybe that documentary was based on the book that I read. Because I read a book about Monopoly, too. And about so the then, freaking lawsuit. And, and... Yeah, so then you know What's that it, Monopoly was actually invented by a woman. And yeah. it was specifically what she had done was made an, an educational tool to try to show the evils of land ownership. Yeah. And that and that land ownership 
will eventually lead to one person having all the money and leaving everybody else destitute. And that's the yeah. origins of monopoly. <laughs> And that's not surprising because there is no Monopoly game that ends in 35 minutes with everyone playing going, you know what? That was a fun game. <laughs> yeah. That was a really fun game and I loved it. And we should definitely play that again sometime. No, Monopoly ends horribly. Yeah, Monopoly, Monopoly ends does. with a lot of really pissed off people. Yeah, Monopoly ends with lives, with bridges burned. But then in the, in the Depression, everybody was poor. They... They just kind of like the idea of getting all the money and fucking people over. Yeah. Yeah, so then so then the 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 end of the Osagi Indian murders is that in 1925 Congress who it should say is was indirectly responsible for all of the murders in the first goddamn place. Because America can't stop screwing Indians over. Yeah. Um, in 1925, Congress passed a law saying that only full-blooded Osagi Indian tribe members could inherit oil rights. And white America went, oh, <laughs> not, not fair. Man. Uh, I, I'm sure there was a public outcry. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the end of my first... Steve's historical approximations. Yes, it that is a... the story of the Osagi Indian murders. It's a fucked up story, and if you would like to learn more about the Osagi Indians, then read a fucking book every once in a while. <laughs> Damn, son, America's fucked up. Yeah, what were you? You were you were telling me about something, and I already had in my mind the idea for Steve's historical approximations. What were you talking about? Oh, chicken pox! No, 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 smallpox, smallpox. Smallpox, yeah. Cowpox. Yeah. Cowpox, smallpox. Oh, oh yeah. Is, well, smallpox is always great with the Indian community. They they love it. Smallpox, largepox, well, I mean, mediumpox, cowpox. Since we're talking about that, yeah, the, the the smallpox vaccination is the only human vaccination that has been completely eradicated, a hundred percent. Yeah. And the man that it was responsible for this, he was. Researching and finding that how uh, milkmaids, they never got smallpox, ever. Yeah. So he tried to figure out why. Well, it turns out that um, they would milk the cows, and the cows would have uh, this, what would be called cowpox, on their udders. And so he hypothesized that they don't get it because they um, have a variation of it already in their system to protect them. They have an Im immunity. Yeah. So he decided to test this theory on his children. <laughs> yeah. He, he scraped off these uh, scabs. He smashed them up and put a little bit of water in them, cut his children, and smashed these uh, cowpox into their system. <laughs> Emerald's face is just priceless here in a way that I can't yeah. describe. This is one reason why we have a whole ethics board. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he after he did that, he yeah. then exposed his children to smallpox. <laughs> and thankfully for them, they were immune. So that's how we found the vaccination for smallpox. <laughs> nice. And why we have ethics boards. <laughs> kind of like nice. my parents did. Fuck, fucked up pox. family, but nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, I mean, I know psychologists have, I mean, it's obvious they've spent years studying their own children. I don't Amber has come out now, too. To make a face. I don't see how that works considering you're the one parenting them. So how would you know if you're fucking up? Yeah. And also, did he tell people that? Like, I imagine like the reality of science is go. kind of fucked up where people are like, congratulations on curing smallpox. How did you do? How did you come up with this? Oh, I just fucked my kids up pretty bad. Like I cut I my kid's arm open, gave them cowpox and then realized that they're no longer going to get smallpox. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, research. <laughs> Oh, I did it just hitting the books. Like, I imagine there's a lot of stories like that. So, how did you solve this disease? Oh, I did a ton of really fucked up shit to bunny rabbits. Well, I mean, there's... I don't understand why people take psychologists' research on their own children for absolute, considering you're studying your own children, so you are you can alter any of those elements, any of those variables at any time. 
because you're the parent and the researcher. Yeah. I mean, well, that that always I, that reminds me of when I was in college, and you, you had to take core classes, and one of them, you, you know, you would have to take some kind of. You wound up having to take psychology, and in psychology, you had to get additional credits by being subjects in other people's experiments, which was kind of oh, fucked wow. up. So I, I I had taken this experiment. Um. Don't know why. Don't remember what anything said or the descriptions or anything like that. But it's like eight o'clock at night, and it's it's in in a kind of abandoned part of the uh, campus. <laughs> okay, were you flatlined? I, I I thought I was gonna be, and there was like nobody in this building. It was like dead quiet, and it was dark in the building. Uh, and then up on the third floor was where I was supposed to be, and it was like just this dude's apartment. <laughs> okay, and I'm like, yeah, I'm here for the experiment, and he's like, oh, okay, come here, and he sits me down and puts my hand in a bucket of ice, and then he sits down in front of me and looks at me, and I'm like, okay, what what am I supposed to do? He's like, I can't tell you. Well, how long am I supposed to hold my hand in this bucket of ice? It's like, I can't tell you. It's like, well, I think I'm done then. <laughs> and I left. And he said, thank you. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> it's like, he titanic you. Huh? It's he titanic you. It's a game we used to play when we were drinking in California. You'd stick your hand in the um, ice chest. Yeah. Where, you know, the ice has inevitably started to melt. And it's freezing cold, and you see how long you can hold your hand down there. Uh, yeah. Well, he tried. He tried, but I'm not stupid, so I left. Nice. I saw a Titanic documentary once where they talked about how uh, the survivors described. Yeah. The survivors described um, being in the water as as having your entire body in a bucket of ice. I can I can only imagine that this experiment is he was trying to find exactly how long it takes on average for a human to get a fucking clue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean I mean, how long do people sit there? <laughs> yeah. With their hand in a bucket of ice. <laughs> yeah. I might have another Steve's historical approximations for next week. Or I oh, might cool. not. We're gonna like, we're gonna I see we're gonna see how it goes. Anyway, the Osagi Indian murders is a really fucked up part of American history. That is fucked like up. The, the U.S. government is directly responsible for like at least sixty murders. Yeah. You know, like goddamn. You know what? Build as many casinos as you want. Yes, which makes it it, it makes it. In the, uh, Native Americans can do whatever they want as far as yes. long as I care. Yeah. The the only problem is is that is that there are a lot of people opening casinos that are not Native American, like at all. Yes, I believe Harry Shearer from Spinal Tarp wrote a book about that. Yeah, and it was a book about a small town, and the small town was failing and had no revenue, so they decided to make up an Indian tribe. Yeah, that they discovered, and like, oh yeah, so we're all related to Indians, and so we're going to build this big casino. Mm -hmm. 